Professor Arthur Berger and uh, <laughs> Professor Nagraj. I'm Mohammad Riaz, uh, officiating head of the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication at Alia University. Uh, uh, there are two distinguished speakers, and so I don't want to uh, bore you people. Uh, I welcome all the audience and our esteemed speakers. And without wasting much time, I uh, invite and request my colleague, Dr. Kafia Ansar to introduce our speakers and start this session formally. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohammed Riaz. Uh, we have, uh, uh, yes, uh, so yeah, uh, we, you know, it was like, a, uh, it was planned and it was in my mind to do su the such kind of a webinar on uh, media communication research and, and, and semiotic analysis of communication content and media content. So, you know, uh, uh, every time I looked back into some of the, you know, uh, books or some of the references, I, I used to look up at, you know, Dr. Professor Arthur Asa Berger's uh, media analysis techniques and, and ads, fads and, you know, you know, other consumer culture and everything that is, you know, he has explained. So it was, you know, uh, and, and the other speaker that is, you know, uh, Professor K.V. Nagaraj's uh, concepts on communication research and, you know, the, this, you know, uh, his uh, uh, ideal idea. So where actually the reference points for my research. So hence, I thought that, you know, to organize such a uh, mediated mythical discourses and media, you know, communication research, semiotics, analysis, and everything related to it. So some idea that, you know, the young researchers and young uh, you know, faculty can receive out of it. So, you know, uh, so we have with us uh, two uh, very renowned speakers. Uh, professor Arthur S. Berger is a professor emeritus uh, of broadcast and electronic communication arts at San Francisco State University where he taught between 1965 and 2003. He has published more than 100 articles, numerous book reviews, and more than 60 books. Uh, and not more than six, like more than that, you know. Some of his very renowned books are Media Analysis Techniques, which is actually in its sixth edition, uh, uh, which has come out in 2018. Media and Communication Research Methods, uh, Production to Qualitative and Quantitative Approaches. He has also written uh, a number of books on you know, science and society, science in society and culture. Then uh, he has also written a very, you know, uh, recent book on three tropes of uh, on Trump. Then brands and cultural analysis, marketing and American consumer culture, applied discourse analysis, ads, stats and American com consumer culture. These are some of his very renowned books. Uh, his books also have been translated into eight English languages and 13 of his books have also been translated into Chinese. So that's a, you know, a remarkable thing. Uh, the second speaker that we have with us is Professor K.V. Nagaraj, uh, who is also, you know, um, uh, a very renowned professor and he has also served as a professor in many uh, central universities as well as, you know, uh, state universities. He has also been the pro vice chancellor of Assam Central University for uh, quite a few years. And uh, he has supervised more than 50 doctoral scholars and MPhil scholars uh, in, in most of the universities. Even I was also fortunate to be one of his scholars. Uh, he has convened, chaired, and organized uh, serious academic deliberations and congregations. Uh, and the most recent being uh, the International Web Convention on 100 Years of Media Education in South Asia. Uh, so I welcome once again Professor uh, Arthur S. Berger and Professor K.V. Nagraj to speak on today's uh, webinar, which is uh, Mediated Mythical Discourses. So uh, without taking much you know, time, I will uh, now hand over, I'll, I'll request Professor Berger to uh, you know, uh, kindly you know, give his lecture. Thank you. So, uh, Thank you before, very beginning, much. before beginning the lecture, I will, I'll just you know, uh, uh, ask all the participants to keep themselves in you know, muted uh, and uh, uh, so that you know, there is no uh, issue while recording. And, 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 and please kindly do not, you know, present your screen because we will be uh, having a PPT and the, you know, both the speakers will be speaking for 20 minutes each. And at the end, we will be having a 30 minute long, you know, interaction session when the participants can actually ask and interact, uh, you know, with the speakers. So uh, I hope you, all of you will enjoy this session. Uh, so Professor, uh, you know, Professor Berger, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this. It's, uh, uh, I've been to India twice and I've actually lectured there in, in the flesh many, many years ago. But um, nowadays it's much easier to do it virtually. Incidentally, I don't see my image. Can you see me on, on this thing? I don't see my image on the screen. It doesn't matter. 
Okay. All right. So could you um, put on the first uh, slide, um, Ka Kaifia? Yes, How do you pronounce your name? Kaifia? Kaifia. Yeah. Kaifia. Yeah. Yes. Will I be able to see it? Um, yes, I hope so. Okay, there we are. All right. So, um, uh, should I do this? Or are you going to do it? I I'm going to do it. You just can tell me, you know, to. Uh, okay, okay. To the next All right. Slide. All right. Okay. So, um, yes. So, leave it there for a second. Um, what I'm going to talk about are basically two things. One is what I call the myth model. It's, it's an idea I developed in which I suggest that uh, myths inform many aspects of our lives. Uh, and so what I, what I did is I, I, I looked at the way myths are found in history, in, in psychoanalytic theory, in elite culture, and so forth. You want to move on to the next slide, please? Let me, I'm going ahead of myself. Okay. Myth, next slide. Okay. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, uh, the methods of analysis, the work of semiotic theorists who have been useful to me, methods of interpreting uh, texts, uh, focal points in the study. This, but some of this is stuff from my media analysis techniques. Then I go into uh, what a myth is, the myth model, I take the myth of David and Goliath and show how it informs the famous 1984 Macintosh commu uh, uh, computer uh, commercial, perhaps the most famous commercial ever made. And then I also discuss, if I have time, uh, a Fiji advertisement, uh, which I've done a semiotic analysis and offer some conclusions. So on to the next, please. Right. This, uh, this is basically the, f the format from which I work. Basically, uh, I uh, call up the uh, various techniques of analysis that uh, you can use in analyzing a text. A text being a commercial, a novel, an advertisement, uh, almost anything. The, ones, the four basic ones are semiotics, sociological theory, Marxist theory, and psychoanalytic theory. And uh, basically, when I write, I um, when I write on a topic, I look for uh, I'm looking to see how semiotics can help me understand what I'm looking at, how sociological theory has insights I can use, and so forth. So though, and then, but also, I have um, feminist theory, ethical criticism, aesthetic theory, literacy. It could be many different other theories that you can use in analyzing a text. It's just that in cultural studies, which is basically my field, those tend to be the most dominant ones. Okay, next please. Okay. So um, it occurred to me that um, there are basically focal points, uh, uh, five focal points in studying media. And I did them all in A's because uh, of alliteration my students might remember but of course, for um, E, we would put uh, whatever country you're dealing with. But you have the, the text. You have the uh, creative people who, in, number B, who, who do the text. You have the culture in which it uh, is found. You have the audience for that particular text, which is not always the same thing as the, the country. For example, the audience of a program could be a couple of million in America. It's 330 million people. And you have the medium and the constraints that the medium has on the um, on the on the artwork, and, but also on the artist, because um, when you uh, when you create a text, you have to think about uh, what the medium will allow you to do, and you have to think about what your audience is you know is looking for, and so on. All right, so those are two sort of preliminary notions about how I work when I'm doing my work. So. So who are the theorists who've, the semi theorists who've, who've influenced me? Well, of course, do, this so sure, uh, his book, uh, Course in, in General Linguistics, that was, that was a book that changed my life. Uh, you know, people talk about, I, I watch a, sh a show in which people talk about meals they've had, and people say, well, I had this dessert, it changed my life. Well, 
So sure, it changed my life. So I was in London in 1973, and I read it, and I, it changed my life. But then Pierce, his theories about icons and so forth. Yuri Lotman, who uh, is a very influential semiotician on culture and things like that. And one thing that he pointed out is that everything in the text is important. Then, of course, the work of Roland Barth and his application of semiotics to French everyday life. That was a kind of model for me in a lot of the work I've done. And then in later years, uh, I became interested in you know, discourse theory and multimodal discourse theory and work of Van Dyke, or however you pronounce his name. And of course, Bakhtin on intertextuality and his work on humor and so forth, which is a subject I've written about. Next, please. Next. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk about the myth model. A myth is generally a, a traditional religious charter that operates by validating laws, customs, etc., taking the form of stories believed to be true about divine beings and heroes. That's from a, uh, a, an anthropologist, Raphael Patai, who wrote a book called Myth and Modern Man. And the, the second line is quite interesting. It's Mircea Eliade is a, a scholar of religion. And he says, the modern man who feels he, he's non-religious still retains a, a large stock of camouflage myths and degenerated rituals. So that is the point that interests me, the notion that uh, even though we think myth doesn't play a role in our lives, uh, it, it actually does, but it's been camouflaged. So here's the myth model. Incidentally, I used to play this game with my students. I would put them into groups of three and have them analyze, uh, take a myth. Uh, and they did like each one did, each group of three did a different myth and, and they ran it through. And it was quite interesting to see some of the things they came up with. So in any case, you have the myth, you have the psychoanalytic reflections, you have the historical manifestations, you have myth and elite culture, popular culture and everyday life. Now nowadays, I'm not so sure there's a difference between popular culture and everyday life because since the average person spends about 12 hours a day with electronic media, I don't know whether popular culture, which is basically mass mediated and everyday life, which I consider to be non mass mediated, but we know that there's such a thing as everyday life, which is not mass mediated, so we can leave it in there. Okay, next, please. So here's the myth of David and Goliath. Uh, this is it's from the Bible. Uh, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Uh, and the Lord will haunt, hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. And he kills him with a slingshot. So that is, uh, that is a basic myth that most people who grew up in, in America and maybe Western Europe who, who read the Bible and so forth are familiar with. Okay. So I can take that myth, and I'm, what, I'm, what I'm going to argue is that it informs the, the, the 1984 commercial. So next, please. So here we have the myth. Um, uh, something is missing. I don't know, uh, I don't know what, uh, what, to, what to call it, but then, okay, let's skip it. Uh, we have the historical, the, the battle between App, uh, Apple and IBM. because This is put out by Apple against its rival, MB, uh, IBM. Uh, you might say, maybe if I psychoanalyze like the Oedipus complex or something like that, you have elite culture, da sculpture of David, you have a 1984 Macintosh commercial, and in everyday life you have children playing with slingshots or people buying Macintosh computers, you see. So what I'm arguing is that um, this myth informs much of our behavior and could be seen as basic to understanding why people bought their Macintosh com commercial. So this is the storyboard from the 1984 commercial. Now I happened to be teaching, I was a visiting professor at the Annenberg School of Communication in Southern California, University of Southern California in 1984. And I saw that commercial. So I called the uh, advertising agency, they came to, and they showed it to me and they talked about it and so forth. What I was to later find out is that uh, the people who, that Apple didn't want to show that commercial. They thought it was too you know, far out and so forth. But it turns out to be um, the best investment they made as far as commercials are concerned because after that commercial came out, their sales, their sales went like crazy and the commercial was shown on countless stations. They only, they bought two, they got rid of, 
they they sold one and they wanted to sell the other one, but the person in charge of selling it dragged his feet, so it was actually shown, and that was sort of a, hit, a happy accident. So next to the next slide. So you now this is the uh, the crucial thing here. I assume that most of you are familiar with this with this commercial, but if you're not, you can go to YouTube and download it, and you'll see. And this woman is actually, a, I think, a German woman, and she we see her. Uh, racing uh, in the in the commission, we see her racing and being chased by sort of police, and she's got this sledgehammer. Next, please. She enters this large auditorium where these uh, these stooges uh, who are who have been brainwashed uh, are watching the watching the the screen, and and a brainwasher is is. Uh, giving them a, a lot of gobbledygook. It's sort of, uh, it, it's all English, but it doesn't make any sense. And she throws, uh, she throws the sledgehammer against the screen. The next one, please. Now, you, know, you can see just below his eye, you can see the sledgehammer uh, about to crack that screen. And when it crashes into the screen, in essence, what it does is it destroys the hold that this uh, this character has on the the people, and uh, in in an article I wrote about this, I suggested, well, this may be IBM, this man may be an IBM bureaucrat, and this is going to destroy the hole that IBM has on on people. So, uh, so that to me is a very significant uh, image. Uh, next, please. Okay, next. All right. So one la second thing I want to do is talk about. A, um, the use of semiotics in analyzing uh, print advertisement. This, this was a commercial, this is a print advertisement. I found this, uh, this advertisement to be very interesting because it's so f full of, you know, symbols and things. First of all, uh, it's in French, which uh, signifies, um, signifies uh, sophistication and so forth. Uh, and then it has this woman who is, is south uh, southeastern somehow, a native island, Chorandia or something like that, who signifies sort of the other, you know, the civilized women, and then there's these other women in these islands where uh, where there's a different kind of sex. Then she has a snake around her neck, and uh, the snake, of course, is a phallic symbol, and that suggests that suggests. Uh, that, um, that sex, a very strong sexual element to this uh, to this story, and actually, um, actually, if you if you look, if the the snake forms an S, and you look at the, it, I don't know if you can see my hands, but if you look at the top of the of the of the bottle, the top of the uh, of the of the stop, the top of the bottle, and the top of the uh, perfume. Uh, oh. Okay, the top of the bottle, the top here, and, and the top and the here, it's like an E. And then her fingers form an X. So what I'm arguing is that hidden in this uh, image is the word sex. But of course, that's what perfume is all about. You know, next, please. Next. Okay, so uh, here's the myth model applied to, to the Fiji perfume. Uh, you have the myth, the snake, Adam and Eve in the garden. Psychoanalytic, you have a snake as a phallic symbol. In history, you have Cleopatra killing herself with a nasp. In elite culture, you have Antony and Cleopatra. In pop culture, you have the Fiji advertisement. In everyday life, you have a woman dabbing uh, Fiji perfume on herself and the hidden SEX in the advertisement. Okay, next, please. So um, this is a, a more elaborated version of, of what you find in the Fiji perfume. Uh, flowers are the sexual organs of plants. You have myth of passion in the Polynesian island and Gauguin and all the wonderful paintings he did of these women. We have Adam and Eve, which I talked about. You have dark hair and ideas we have about sexuality in, in, in Western Europe. And, uh, where um, some sociologists have suggested blondes are sort of symbols of coldness and aloofness, whereas women with dark hair are, are symbols of sexual vitality and things like that. Then you have the perfume as kind of magic, and some people have said it's perfume is like venom. 
you have the notion of sophistication in which um, Fiji uh, is advertised in French and uh, French is, uh, is in the popular mind a, a symbol of sophistication and so forth. You have the design of the ads in which the, uh, the eyes, of, uh, the snake leads the eyes of the perfume. Uh, you have the fingers grasping the perfume in some strange way. That actually, I read that there's a painting from the 1800s or the 1600s, something like that, which has a woman with her hands like that. And then you have the sex found hidden in the images. Next, please. Uh, and the, in the uh, ad we've seen the, in the commercial, we have the boots of the prisoners, which are uh, very heavy and suggested they're, they're, they're uh, under, under the control. We have the blonde as the sort of mythic figure who is a sort of mediator between uh, these, uh, the proles and the, uh, and the brainwasher. You have the double talk in the brainwashing scenario. You have the big brother's look, which is a kind of bureaucratic uh, personality who I suggest might be IBM. You have the double talk uh, in the message. You have the battle between the big blue and the Macintosh. And, and then we have the Fiji and the paradise myth that is, is part of that model. Next, please. Okay. So the conclusions, uh, it's a very abbreviated uh, thing. Uh, since it's very difficult for me to say everything I want to talk about in 20 minutes, but I'm trying to do the best I can. So we have, the first thing is my argument that myth plays an important role in our lives. Uh, second is that uh, we people, we don't generally recognize the way myth does, but if we look at many mass mediated texts and so forth, if we look carefully at them, we can often find mythic elements in these texts. Um, the model shows how myths inform uh, various aspects of our lives. Uh, the Macintosh uh, commercial is an example of the role of myth in popular culture. And uh, semiotic analysis, uh, which I've sort of alluded to, but haven't dealt with it in too much detail, explains their power and how they affect people. So basically, I think that's the last, is that the last slide? You think so? Is that the last slide? Oh, oh, some of my books, okay. So, um, uh, I have, a, I wrote a book called Media, Myth, and Society, which talks about myths, many different myths, and shows uh, how they, I use, I apply the, the myth model to many different myths and show how it, it shows up in pop culture and elite culture and so forth. My analysis of the, uh, of the, uh, the uh, commercial uh, is found in ads, fads, and consumer culture. Uh, I've written an, another book, which I guess you all know about media analysis techniques, which has a lot about, um, about, uh, using semiotics and other approaches to analyze media. And, and my latest book is called US Pop, uh, USA Pop, which is about pop culture and applies semiotics and many other theories to different aspects of American popular culture. So with that, I conclude my little dissertation on um, sex, semiotics, media, media analysis and related concerns. Thank you, uh, Professor Berger. You actually, you know, said a lot of things uh, and uh, quite, you know, beautifully analyzed, uh, you know, two advertisements. Uh, and actually, you know, I, I could relate to some of these, you know, semiotic aspects in that are actually run in our mass media, you know, uh, you know, the things that we come across in our media in this part in South Asia like in terms of soap, opera, soap operas, in terms of advertisements, uh, like we can relate to all these things that are there. Like, yeah, and Carl Jung has, you know, said uh, very uh, you know, rightly that myth is a collective unconsciousness. And we actually, without realizing, we, we actually consume all these mythified, uh, mythified, you know, mediated discourses every day. And, and, and we actually are unconscious about its act, you know, actions taking in our psyche. And then, you know, the second order signification that takes place on, on every object, every other sign, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the content that is disseminated to us. So that also needs to be looked at by media scholars. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have given, uh, you know, an example of the myth model that you have used. I hope the scholars who are attending today's lecture will be benefited and uh, they, it might generate uh, new insights into them. 
thank you. I would now request our uh, you know next speaker, <coughs> Professor K V Nagpal, to kindly deliver his lecture, and then we will go into the you know uh, introduction session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kaifia. Good morning to Professor Arthur, Professor Mohammad Shahidullah, and other friends. Yeah. I'm not going into a technical session uh, in the sense mine will be a general overview of what is happening in communication research in India. I called it many dimensions of communication research because we know that uh, uh, still, uh, even after 100 years of media education in the country, the type of research we are doing, the type of uh, ideas that we have got, I think every should, uh, everything should undergo a sea change. I always criticize my own self uh, rather than others, just to say that we are 30, 40 years behind in communication research when we talk about other countries, including our neighboring countries. Uh, let me start with a statement that in India, communication research is not always synonymous with media research. There is a subtle difference because, you know, media research is considered as professional and market oriented. If you ask me what kind of research is being done by the professional media organizations or houses, I will tell you the, uh, you know, uh, the ground zero level situation is absolutely abysmal. Communication research on the contrary is considered as academic in character. Media research employs the market research techniques of management schools. You know, because they are market oriented, they opt, uh, opt for those techniques which are used by marketing research agencies. Public sector institutions like All India Radio and Doordarshan have their own research wings that do audience research. But the issue here is they do not have the professionalism of the kind of research that should be done. In fact, there is a difference between uh, public sector research and private sector research in India when it comes to uh, mediated messages or even other contents which are not mediated. Advertising agencies that seek time slots on electronic media, especially television channels, depend upon TRPs generated by independent agencies. Today, that is also in question because TRPs are also being manipulated. So uh, now the question of what kind of research is being done in India can be very easily answered. And when we go to the other area uh, that is an adjunct of uh, mass communication, public relations, or what we call as corporate communication, this particular sector in India does not have the luxury of research components in their routine operations. Even if they conduct research, it is on a small scale with a limited purpose. In India, communication media research, communication bar media or communication media research can be classified broadly into academic and professional. So uh, this is a, a quite uh, amusing to many people uh, in the other parts of the uh, world, but it is uh, a fact that we tend to make this distinction for the simple reason, you know, uh, this kind of uh, research does not, what we do in academic institutions in particular, it does not reach anyone beyond the academic institutions. So, uh, this is one point which I would like to make. This is where I am highly, uh, I am highly critical of what is happening. Most of the research in India is survey research, both in private and public sectors. And in addition, most academic research is done by universities and other educational institutions, which 
have a limited purpose of reaching a limited audience. Unfortunately, excepting a few institutions down south, I am talking about South India, you know, uh, much of communication research in the country, part particularly uh, up country, what I mean is North India, you know, their research is drab, repetitive, and irrelevant. I'm highly critical of what we have been doing because I believe that a kind of introspection is necessary for us to do the kind of research which reaches out to a larger audience. So this is what I, again, much of it is effects research. We talk about television effect, we talk about uh, radio, we talk about uh, you know print media effect. How long we are going to talk only about uh, effects research? Should we not think of uh, causal research, which has been pointed out by uh, Dennis McQuill in one of his articles? Uh, there is a little evidence of causal research in India, and the type of multidisciplinary research as regards communication has to improve. Now we are uh, having a debate whether we should allow people from other disciplines to do research in mass communication or communication or media. Now there are people in sociology. I know that people in other countries who did uh, a lot of research uh, on communication or media were from other disciplines like sociology, political science and management, psychology. I know uh, being a student of literature, I must confess that I am influenced by the French authors uh, like Sartre, Camus, Badrila, Rola Barth, and many others. So when I read those types of, uh, you know, insights that have been provided, I, know I feel a little hesitant to talk about our own uh, quality of research. Faculty from sociology, literature, political science have made attempts, but have left much to be desired as they lack the communication experience or the communication perspective of the media or the media perspective to be precise. Both qualitative and quantitative research efforts have not reached the level that is expected of. For example, higher level statistical evaluation is rather unheard of because I know how it is being done. And you know, I, I just say, we tend to stop at what we call as non-parametric tests. We don't go to parametric tests or higher level statistics. Even when we talk about reliability and validity, I know where we stand. At the most, as I said, researchers have just opted for what is easier and what can be done with little effort. In the case of qualitative research, we have not yet drawn much from literature, psychology, or even applied linguistics. In fact, when I uh, read about pragmatics as part of applied linguistics, you know, I, I get enthused because the kind of research that is being done there is quite interesting. There is enormous scope for discourse analysis. I think Professor Arthur has just mentioned it. And, uh, and narrative analysis or rhetorical analysis, deconstruction, conversation analysis, and, uh, and uh, other things. Uh, there are uh, many, many uh, streams of analysis which we can think of. Another area of importance is uh, semiotic analysis uh, on which Professor Arthur Berger is an authority. In fact, I read a uh, dissertation recently from Pondicherry University. It was uh, a semiotic analysis of advertisements uh, on certain TV channels. It was quite interesting to read, even though I, I thought that it was not up to the international level, but in the Indian context, I found that analysis was 
it's quite uh, interesting and uh, i was quite appreciative of the effort and uh, you know there are other areas which we have not done much for example uh, media aesthetics you know we have not done anything and the second area of importance is media management you know there is not a single book which is uh, worth its name uh, in india on media management in india you can understand how we teach media management we take american examples uh, and uh, the indian context is totally missing and another important point i would like to mention is the lack of innovation when we apply research methods see there is lot of scope for uh, doing uh, you know innovative research one of my students you know when he wanted to know the role of a newspaper uh, in uh, rural development he started a newspaper rural newspaper published it for 9 months and ultimately he found out that you know uh, the uh, inference that was drawn it was quite interesting in the sense the newspaper was not important but the editor of the newspaper had an important uh, place in the social setup of the villages you know the newspaper failed but the editor was successful <laughs> so you can understand how it happens why can't we do such things you know even in experimental research i think this certain things of this kind can be done both qualitative and quantitative content analysis can be modified to suit the objectives of the research proposals in the indian context what we need now is upgradation of research skills and uh, you know uh, this is not only among research scholars but also among media educators the rigor of research should be ensured another area of promise is that of media history in india there is no comprehensive book on uh, media history in india for the simple reason there are too many languages and of course we cannot bring all of them together uh, in a single place and that is where i think we uh, you know run into difficulty but when it comes to english journalism english language journalism i mean i think uh, we, we could have done quite a lot recently when i read a book on james augustus sicky written by a foreign scholar i found uh, that I, i felt myself ashamed of it because sitting in india we have not done that kind of research media history there is a problem in india that is it, they think it is cataloging media history is not cataloging it should be you know analyzed in the context of politics in the context of uh, the social system and also in the context of economic priorities so the contextual narratives are uh, really required when we write uh, history this is where i always mention the history of american journalism by frank luther mart or edwin emery and others so this is where i think we can learn from them uh, even though at the end i am going to talk about de westernization or decolonialization of research you know uh, this is where we can uh, take something from them content analysis can be made innovative by applying more than one method and this is the most popular area of research in india where we can think of innovative methods application of uh, research methods borrowed from other disciplines and redesigned to meet our needs uh, that is uh, communication scholars can be experimented with the most important point which i would like to uh, uh, discuss right now is the plagiarism i'm i don't know uh, where to start where to end because this has uh, uh, you know assumed pandemic proportions 
I'm I'm sorry to say this, but uh, people think the cut and paste business is uh, the most acceptable business uh, in research. This is where I believe we have to have the real moral and ethical courage to uh, think of. Media aesthetics is another area which I have already mentioned. And what we need is an oversight institution uh, to monitor and promote communication or media research in India. There is an organization which most of us know, uh, you know, Indian Council of Social Science Research, which is trying to bring in, uh, you know, a qualitative change uh, in social science research. But our problem, uh, problem of communication uh, teachers is, uh, in some places we are considered as uh, people belonging to humanities. In uh, some other places, uh, it is uh, social sciences. And in some other places, we are clubbed with uh, languages. I do not know where do we stand and what we can do. But I still believe ICSSR can focus more on uh, media research to help us. Otherwise, you know, under the new education policy, where multidisciplinary research is being uh, encouraged by a new organization that is going to be set up, a national uh, research foundation, you know, it can also think in terms of, uh, you know, uh, 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 dedicating a small amount of budget for media research or communication research, whatever it is. Uh, this uh, organization, oversight organization, can be a non-profit alliance of media houses and academic institutions, because I always think that if we depend upon the government, you know, the governments, when, they, when the power structure changes, their priorities also change. The best thing is to have a collective or an, an alliance of media houses because I'm always critical of the media houses in India because they have not shown much interest in particularly in research. Many media houses have their own uh, uh, media organization uh, which are imparting uh, education, training in communication, uh, media research, but uh, unfortunately, it is not up to our expectation. Uh, then lastly, I talk about uh, de-Westernization or decolonialization. Some people do not want to use the word de-Westernization. They want to talk about decolonialization. How to go about it? It is, I think, a very relevant uh, debate in India, whether we should uh, accept the uh, tools and methods given by the Westerners, the lock, stock, and barrel, or whether we should go a little further and then say we are changing our course of action, our uh, uh, path of analysis. Can we do that? How is it possible? Recently, I was doing a, a research on uh, two great uh, saints uh, of India, Adi Shankara and Ramanuja where in order to understand the difference between monism and monotheism, I had to struggle for not less than two months. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it is possible. It is possible. It is not difficult. It are, say it may be difficult, but it is possible if we concentrate on these things. So uh, I, I can go on talking and uh, uh, talking. I think uh, my time is up. They have given me 20 minutes being loquacious. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I, I, I just cannot uh, uh, stop, but uh, now I am compelled to stop. I think with these few remarks, I end my, I do not want to say discourse, my ramblings, mm -hmm. and hope there will be uh, some reaction that will lead to a good interaction. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. 
uh, you have you know rightly spoken about the lack of causal research in in, in mass media and media and communication research uh, and there are you know lack of linguistic and application of other uh, other you know, uh, you know research methods uh, from other disciplines you know and there can there are a lot of scope for innovation in media research and you know and and also you know you have stressed on uh, you know inclusion of more linguistic analysis pragmatics and and discourse analysis in mass media content research so you know with this uh, now uh, we are opening the session for uh, interaction so i see some questions in the chat box i will also uh, you know request participants if they want to ask anything to you know both of our speakers they can you know write in the chat box and and uh, you know we can take that up so the first question is uh, pro for professor berger uh, you know surita yes dr surita basu if you want you can ask your question uh, you know or or uh, i can also say that i can also repeat your question so uh, professor berger she uh, dr surita basu wants to you know know that do you think the semiotic interpretation of commercials can also otherwise be analyzed through reception studies and uh, and she also thinks uh, you know how much semiotic analyses are uh, if if uh, semiotic analyses are highly subjective so you know your thoughts on I that i didn't hear i didn't hear the okay, last so, part uh, how much semiotic analysis is what analysis are yes are highly subjective oh predict she thinks predictive oh yes no subjective if they are too subjective if they suffer from subjective biasness of the you know researcher Well, you have to understand that um, uh, when you make a semiotic analysis, uh, a lot of people uh, say, um, "Is what you're finding in the text uh, in the text, or is it in your mind?" That is, are you reading something in in you know reading something in your mind into the text? You're looking for something to to put in. So you always have that problem with semiotic analysis. Uh, um, it's it's not the kind of research that um, many communication scholars like uh, because it's it's not quantitative. Uh, I, I I remember when I was uh, in the hallway at, at the University of Southern California when I just arrived, the dean there was talking about my book, Media Analysis Techniques. This is the first edition of that. It was in 1980. You know, it came out in the 70s or something like that. He said it's it's data free. It, so uh, that book and, and much of my work is is data free. That is, it's not the kind of uh, the kind of article that communication scholars like when they can quantify and fiddle around with things and so forth and so on. But um, as your other speaker, as he said, uh, a lot of a lot of communication scholars uh, look for data that's easy to quantify, but it doesn't necessarily tell you anything. So uh, semiotics is a kind of, uh, is a, you have to sort of look at the logic of the argument of the semiotician and see whether it makes sense. Uh, that's, for example, if you read Roland Barthes' mythologies in which he's analyzing soap powders, <laughs> uh, you say, well, what's, what's going on here? What, what, you know, he's talking about different kinds of soap powders. Is, and that is semiotic analysis. But what the goal of that isn't to talk about the difference between the different kinds of soap powders, it's to show what it reflects about French culture. And so much of my work is involved with showing either unconscious uh, things that are un that we're unaware of when you're analyzing it, or something about how it reflects about the culture or the, or the audience or whatever it is. And so that's why it, it's useful. But uh, for many, uh, you know, I can't say that, um, when I make these analysis, and sometimes uh, it's informed by psychoanalytic theory too, a lot of people consider it absolutely ridiculous. My students always use consider my psychoanalytic semiotic interpretation ridiculous, but that's uh, part of the course. I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, that's the best I can do. Uh, I think so. She must have got her answer. So uh, the next uh, question that we have is uh, from Dr. Junali Deka. She's a faculty in Tejpur University's uh, teaching mass media, mass communication. So she asks, uh, you know, uh, to Professor K.V. Nagras that what innovative techniques can we use in content analysis? Uh, I expected this uh, question from her. 
Uh, the issue is uh, simple. When you talk about uh, the quantification in content analysis, you can do very little. But when it comes to qualitative analysis, you know, uh, you can do quite a lot of uh, things. It can be, you, you can use the technique of rhetoric analysis, narrative analysis. You know, in nowadays people talk about uh, a new <coughs> stream of, uh, uh, you know, academic uh, pursuit that is narratology. You know, narrative techniques are also gaining uh, popularity among the media persons. You know, uh, the earlier tendency of uh, in producing a content which was straight uh, uh, to the brain of the reader, it has changed. Now everything is being, uh, you know, it, it is in the short story format. So there, uh, there is a chain. Discourse analysis. I think one of uh, the research scholars in Assam University applied the discourse analysis method to entertainment pages of a newspaper. So you can, if you think that you can apply this or that, depending upon your interest and uh, also the uh, contextual relevance, you know, uh, it is quite interesting, it can be done. You know, if you are going to apply discourse analysis to the coverage of uh, an agitation in Assam, it is also quite interesting. You know, I always say, you know, better to use, there is a slight difference between discourse analysis and critical discourse analysis. You know, even there, you have certain classifications. You know, if you want to use the social historical perspective as the base, you can do it. Or you can also take, uh, you know, critical aspects of uh, the uh, social system. You can do that. You know, everything is possible provided you do it. So content analysis, when it comes to qualitative analysis, you can do wonders. But one thing I must tell you, being a student of literature, again, I'm repeating it. Uh, you know, what I feel as objective may not be objective to you. It can be subjective. See, uh, when you imagine things, I believe they are going to be subjective to some extent. You can't avoid it. I think I have answered her question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so we have a lot of questions. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is Mr. Uh, I think Amit Sharma, uh, who is a PhD scholar in uh, Manipal University. Uh, so he asks why media research is limited to academic purpose only and, uh, and why not we are making any significant changes in the real world media. So I don't know, you know if he wanted to ask it to Professor K.V. Nagar. So, sir, if you want, you can answer it and then we'll go to another question. Okay, let me answer this question. It has got uh, uh, its own history. The pro whole problem in India is there is a one-way traffic between the media and the media educational institutions. You see, we are the, uh, you know, a media educational institutions supply manpower to the media, but on the other side, media have not shown any interest in media education. I tell you my own example briefly. When I went to a newspaper office to uh, get a job, my editor asked me, you are BA in journalism. I remonstrated. I said, no, I am MA in journalism. He said, oh, you have an additional disqualification. <laughs> and now you can understand. See, but things have changed. You know, over I'm talking of 1973. Today, things have changed, but yet we don't have what I always talk of, you know, e a union of media houses and media educational institutions. Unless until we are going to have this kind of an arrangement, a two-way traffic, this is going to happen like this. Fortunately, you know, things are changing. I think in another 10 to 15 years, I believe that media houses will understand the importance of research. And also, academicians will understand the importance of doing 
some good research i don't want to say extraordinary research some good research which can also help the media houses i believe that is the situation now okay thank you sir so we have uh, with us professor mira ke besai she is a professor in sndt university pune so she has her question uh, for uh, professor warger and, and i would request uh, ma'am to kindly unmute yourself and you can ask the question directly no i was just uh, curious because uh, uh, professor budget you said uh, mind takes over the kind of data so how does a researcher avoid uh, one's own mind over the kind of content that he or she is researching if you are advised yeah yeah now, this is an interesting question because um, uh, if you do qualitative research and then it seems to me what you have to do is you have to you have to make an argument that a person who is you know who um, reads your your analysis would would say is reasonable um there's always the element of you know there's always the element of uh, whether an analysis in in qualitative research is is in in the text or or in the mind of the the analysis so to get around that you have to make an argument and generally the way i make the, the way i make the arguments i look for people who've written on the same subject writers theorists so forth who have something interesting to say about it and quote them is sort of you can think of it as like a legal case um my wife always says oh you're reading stuff into you're reading stuff into this you're reading stuff into that you know but but um i don't i don't accept that i i my argument is that um the reason people think that uh, we're reading things into a text that we're analyzing say is because they're unaware of the complexity of of the text and of the you know for example lotman Yuri Lotman, the uh, the Russian semiotician, said everything in a text is important. You know? So if everything in a text is important, that means when you analyze a text, there are many different things you have to consider. So, for example, in my uh, in my book, uh, Media Analysis Techniques, uh, I have a chapter in analyzing a, a text, and I list all the different things you have to consider. Like if you're talking about that uh, that that commercial I'm uh, not the commercial the uh, the the printed ad I showed you there's many many different things to talk about the color the the fact that the woman you only see the, the bottom of the woman's head her hair the orchid in her in her hair uh, the, her hands you know her her smile and so on. so all of this stuff is potentially interesting and important so uh, when i make the semiotic analyses I try to you know I try to suggest that um there is a reason you know that that my insights are not just sort of invented out of my <laughs> you know invented and and just sort of plugged into the thing that they that they're actually there but the problem of all qualitative analysis is that if you don't have data that some people insist is you need you need data and so forth uh then you know, you're you're at a disadvantage and when i was when i um, when i taught uh, i said when i taught the course in semiotics it's really interesting i um i always had a lot of exercises in which i asked the students to apply the concepts from semiotics to a text that i showed them so i i had a couple of exercises in which we practiced applying some of the con- the, the uh, ideas and then i showed them an episode of a of a television program called the prisoner i don't know whether you're familiar with it but it was a cult cult uh, television series in the uh, in the 60s with patrick mcgowan and it happened to have a number of, of episodes that lent themselves very well to uh, different kinds of analysis a semiotic analysis psychoanalytic analysis marx and that. so different 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 uh, episodes and my idea for the conclusion the the final examination was to show them an episode of the prisoner and ask them to write four different analyses of the same episode so they would understand that there's more than one way <laughs> of of seeing things uh, so you know when when i say that i'm a semiotician i am a semiotician but um 
that uh, also involves uh, sometimes Marxism. If you think about Roland Barthes, he was a Marxist semitician. Uh, so um, I use many different disciplines. Whatever, whatever fits, uh, whatever, whatever discipline gives me information that I can use to sort of interrogate and, and make the text more interesting and understandable. That's what I use. But I cannot, uh, unfortunately, I cannot offer the kind of proof that uh, people who uh, are, are uh, quants and statistically oriented want. But uh, to me, that's, you know, there's plenty of room for everyone to do all kinds of different research. So um, for semioticians, let them uh, analyze wrestling and soap detergents and uh, you know, things like that. And for statistical people, let them do um, effects research. Although I, I have generally found effects, re effects research to be interesting in some respects, but I don't know. It, it seems to it doesn't seem to lead anywhere. I don't know. But that's maybe because I'm a quant, not a qual. I'm a qual rather than a quant. I hope that Thank answers you so it. much. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, sir. Thank you so much. So, uh, so related to that, there we have another question from uh, Mr. Binod Chetri. Uh, so he has asked uh, to, the question to Professor Berger that what is your opinion on using narrative analysis and critical discourse analysis to analyze political cinema? Ah, <laughs> it's interesting that you ask. Interesting that you ask that question. Uh, first of all, I I have uh, written a book called Applied Discourse Analysis which um, uh, deals with um, uh, how you can use discourse analysis to, uh, to interrogate all kinds of different things. You know. It seems to me, if you take multimodal critical discourse analysis, basically you're a semitician, you see. Uh, if, you, if you look at, I mean, the multimodal people say they're interested in, in the visual images, they're interested in language, they're, you know, and so forth. So the only difference might be that maybe the multimodal uh, uh, discourse analysts are more interested in language than in the image, but semioticians are, you know, and, dis and I don't see too much of a distance between the critical multimodal discourse analysts and, uh, and uh, semioticians. Now it turns out <laughs> that I have, uh, I'm, I'm going to be giving a talk to Moscow, uh, University of Moscow, and I chose, uh, the subject of my talk was uh, a, a television commercial called Covita. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Covita, but during the Trump campaign, there's a group of re Republicans who loathe everything that Trump stands for. I would agree with them. And uh, they did this, uh, this TV commercial called Covita, which is basically to Evita. It's to the sound of to the, to, the, to the music of Evita, but the texts all have to do with Trump. And it shows different images of Trump doing this, Trump doing that, and so forth and so on. It's a very powerful thing. So what I'm suggesting is that, yes, you can use, uh, you, and it's a very useful thing to do, is to use semiotic analysis, discourse analysis, you know, critical discourse analysis, I mean, Van Dyke said that one of the things discourse analysts have to do is to look at the ideology hidden in all the, all the text that people consume. Well, that's not very far from what a Marxist, you know, a Marxist semiotician would say. So the subject is a very interesting one, and I, I think that it's, it uh, it'd be useful for people to take uh, to take political advertising and things as a subject for analysis. And I I would urge you to to give it a try. Thank you, uh, Professor Burgess. So now we have one question for Professor K.V. Nagraj. Uh, this, this, it is being asked by Vishuddeep Bhattacharya, who is a research scholar at uh, Alia University. So Vishuddeep wants to know, uh, like, while transcribing responses received from semi-structured interview uh, during an in-depth interview uh, research method, how can one limit the scope of researchers' bias? Well, uh, it depends upon the researcher. <laughs> if he wants to be free from bias, if he is a, a moralist, then there is no problem. The researcher's bias comes only when he is interested in, you know, uh, making the responses suit uh, his needs. No, it should not be. 
you know, uh, researcher's bias can be eliminated only when the researcher is honest. If he is not honest, then uh, I, I don't think it is possible uh, to avoid researcher's bias. You know, researcher's bias can be there in everything. I tell you, from the beginning of, uh, you know, uh, uh, making your objectives, uh, you know, when you prepare your objectives, then when you are putting your uh, questions, the structure of the question itself can lead to uh, what we call as bias. So it all depends upon how he is going to do it. So let him be free from all these uh, biases, do it in a straightforward manner. I think there should not be any problem because uh, to be honest, um, the 60 plus research scholars uh, from different universities of the country whom I had the opportunity of supervising I think not even, and some of them are from Bangladesh also. I think uh, Professor Saidullah knows. Uh, you know, uh, nobody resorted to any kind of, uh, you know, plagiarism or you know, any kind of bias to creep in. So this is where I believe personal integrity is m the most important thing. Let him forget about all other things. Uh, sir, we have another question for you. Uh, it is directed to Professor K.V. Nagraj. The question is being asked by, uh, you know, Vishal Vinit, uh, who asks, asks that, you know, in Indian media context, like media research is different, as you have mentioned, and, uh, and it also lacks communication research. So uh, how a, a young researcher can overcome it? I hope I have made it. Uh, I'm unable to understand the question. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what what does he mean? Uh, uh, can you repeat Indian it? Context, he said, in Indian context, media research okay. is different or lacks communication research perspective. Could we get more insight into it? And how, as a research scholar, one can overcome it? No, it is very clear. What I said is, this media research per se, which we call as being done by the media uh, professionals. It, it, we call it as media research, which is uh, totally oriented towards uh, the market. You know, marketing uh, uh, techniques, research techniques are being employed there because media houses are mostly interested in uh, reaching out to their markets, okay? Academic research is considered as communication research, even though they include media in it, uh, because communicate, the word communication has got a, a broader meaning, they, they, where uh, mass communication also comes into it. So that's where we have thought of, uh, you know, bridging the gap between the media research, the so-called media research, and the, the so-called communication research. So there should be one kind of research which is suitable for, I mean, research approach, which is suitable for both media houses and the media educational institutions. Now, I tell you, the problem in India is we are criticized for doing research in academic institutions uh, you know, that kind of research is, they say it is not relevant to the society. There are two types of arguments. You know, some people say academics should be academics and they should not go beyond, you know, what we call as uh, uh, the plebeian uh, kind of thing that is reaching out to the audience. See, I, I don't understand this kind of distinction, yes, being, uh, you know, public funded institutions, we will have to reach out to the people, the masses. You know, uh, I, this is where I find, you know, uh, low quality soap operas uh, coming out, TRPs are being manipulated because the quality of research that we are supposed to do on all these things are not being done. See, academic research, not many people will do uh, research on soap opera and the results will not go to anybody. They will be there in the library and some people will read and most people will not read. So this kind of uh, attitude is there. So that's why I suggested a collective 
of both media houses and media educational institutions to you know uh, sort out the issues fortunately and as i have told you now many people who have got uh, the academic background uh, in media they are occupying higher positions in media houses in india my own uh, students are there as uh, editors of uh, newspapers and uh, chiefs of uh, television channels so uh, now i think they will have to come forward and for this uh, i am telling you uh, this is an open invitation to professor uh, arthur berger we on mm -hmm. december 18th and 19th of 2021 the valedictory function of uh, uh, 100 years of media education in south asia will take place and there we are going to have a special it is a physical convention uh, professor berger you are invited to it <laughs> if you can make it we will be happy we will send you the details once everything is finalized there we are going to talk about an alliance uh between uh, uh, you know media houses and media educators so media professionals and media educators i think uh, till then this flux will remain as it is hopefully in the coming days things will be uh, different in fact i i personally suggest that he should take such a subject which will be beneficial to both the profession and the academics thank you sir so uh, we will take a couple of more like two three more questions and then we can you know wind it up so the the next question that we have is for professor berger uh, so ja jasdeep kaur chandi he uh, is asking a question to professor berger he says that if we are to semiotically analyze perform performative arts which theorist or theories would be helpful does theoretical approach for semiotic analysis change according to the text we are analyzing first of all uh, let me say I'm, did you say if it's in december are, are you say, the, the conference is in february or when i'll be happy to attend you i'm, I'm uh, here Dece uh, december 18th and 19th of uh, 2021 this year oh <laughs> december uh -huh. <laughs> i'll be happy i'll be happy to uh, i'll be happy to yeah. participate yes sir. thank you thank you very much okay. um would you repeat that question again my uh, yes, yeah. uh, yes, so uh, it is uh, like it uh, he wants to know uh, like if we want to semiotically uh, semiotically analyze performative arts which theorists or theories would be helpful so does yes. the theoretical approach of for semiotic analysis changes according to the text that we are analyzing oh that's a good question yes uh, well of course any time you analyze as say a, a a film uh, in, in semiotics has been very important in analyzing films or a television program or a play or or a commercial you know it's a performance you know you have to realize the performance so you have to um also in addition to the um in addition to the the signifiers and you know signs that you see in there you have to you have to keep in mind the um the ability of the artists to to ha to have to inf to influence people to affect people so for example um in the analysis of the covid commercial incident of that covid commercial is on youtube if you go to youtube and you put in covita you will see this uh, tr uh, trump anti trump uh, commercial well there the quality of the singer's voice is very important in addition the quality of the cutting the images the way they're used and so forth so analyzing a a performance is 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 a much more complicated thing than just sort of analyzing a print advertisement you see uh you but but i consider for example a television commercial to be a performance you have a performance by actors and actresses you have scenery you have cutting you have all kinds of aspects of um, of media aesthetics that have to be considered incidentally when when i taught at um, in my department all students had to take a course in media aesthetics they also had to take a course in media ethics uh and um, 
and of course in research methods, you know. So um, I think that um, when you're dealing with performance, you have to sort of combine like the semiotics of film, the semiotics of theater, and, um, and, the, and the sort of examination of the signifiers and signifiers in the text to, to make sense of it. But it, it adds a, an, a level of complexity to performance because um, like if, it, if it's in the stage, uh, you, you deal with the quality of the acting and the scenery and so forth. But if it's film or video, you have to deal with the media effects, the, the aesthetics of uh, the cutting and you know all of that kind of stuff, which makes it more complicated. But of course, uh, it is, it is the, the key discipline, I would say, in analyzing film. Um, most of the most of the of the really interesting analyses of films, other than like people talk about the quality of the performances, is, is from semioticians who analyze the, these texts in terms using semiotic analysis and and uh, theater, theater uh, theatrical theatrical and aesthetic aspects to the text. Okay. Uh, so we have actually three questions, but you know I can uh, combine them and ask because they are I think related more or less similar. Uh, so, uh, uh, Abhijit Ganguly, Neha Tiwari, and Shovi Kacharya, they ask that, you know, how uh, can, uh, you know, uh, semiotic analysis be applied to indigenous or folk studies or, or traditional uh, tribal, you know, or artifacts? Yes. All right. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of curious that uh, you asked that question because I've devoted a good deal of my life to analyzing artifacts. Uh, I, I, I never really thought about it, but basically it's a study of what is called material culture. And um, I've written something like five books on analyzing material culture, never really thinking about the fact that, that I was doing what, uh, what, what, you know, what, what academics would call material culture. I was just interested in things that uh, appealed to me. I remember when I was in college, uh, in grad school, I, I, had a, I noticed the McDonald's hamburger stand suddenly a, 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 was created one day from when I walked to school, all of a sudden there was this McDonald's hamburger stand. I observed the, 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 the way it worked. So when I wrote an article for the, for the newspaper called the Evangelical Hamburger, in which I argued that McDonald's was like a evangelical religion going to take over the world. Well, this was 1964, you know? mm -hmm. and they had they had arches. They had big yellow arches. They had a sign which showed the number of people who were eating McDonald's hamburgers. Which I was a member of the congregation, so uh, that was the start of my interest in in material culture. And then, as I progressed, I I realized that um, that objects have meaning. I mean, that's the important thing. They have a function, but they also have a, a semiotic meaning. And that is why semiotics is so important in analyzing uh, material culture. Uh, all of the, in fact, I, I have a book called Bloom's Morning, in which I took one day in the life of a typical American. It's, it's based on, on, on Bloom, you know, one day in the life of Bloom. I was going through the whole day, but it was too complicated, so I did it in the morning. And I analyzed everything that Bloom used uh, he was sleeping in a king size bed. What does that mean? He's under a comforter. What does that mean? So all of these objects, and and uh, he used an electric electronic toothbrush. What does that mean? So I spent a lot of time over the years analyzing objects that interested me, and, and um, so I would say that if you're interested in material culture, semiotics is a, a very important aspect of analyzing things. You can also talk, of course. Uh, psychosemiotics, we could call it that way, the psychoanalytic aspects of, sem you know, that semiotics uh, reveals the, uh, the urge for power, phallic symbols in, you know, in objects, you know, things, things like that. So that, that part, uh, I think there's, um, it's a very useful, very useful approach. And I think that a lot of uh, the study of, of media, of um, material culture is moving in that direction. Of course, Roland Barth, uh, gave a great example of that in his mythologies, in which he studied different aspects of French material culture and showed how the, these this objects reflected certain aspects of French culture. Uh, the, the objects were interesting because of what they told you about the French psyche. See. What was the other part of the question? I forgot the... Uh, um, 
So uh, he, yes, uh, like uh, how to do semiotic analysis in tribal or or you know uh, for oh. the development communication. Yeah, well, I would say that regardless of what you're interested in, what you need is uh, you you need an understanding of the way um, the concepts in in semiotics can be applied to whatever subject you're interested in. One of the problems with teaching semiotics in universities, and, and I, I went to Argentina to a semiotics conference, and then I went around to universities, and every professor told me the same thing. We teach students a year of semiotics theory. At the end, they say to us, what are we supposed to do with it? You know, we've got all this theory, because they never think of teaching them how to apply the theory. <laughs> so you could, you know, I, I say semiotics theory is like a pit. You get into that pit, reading, you know, yes, purse. You could spend fifty years trying to understand purse, and never use any of that stuff to talk about culture or, or theater or artifacts or anything like that. So what you have to do is you have to, if you're going to, if you want to do indigenous people, if you want to do artifacts, if you want to do theatrical texts, you have to learn how to apply the concepts of semiotics to that particular text. And the way you do that is you look at the writings of semioticians who have done that and see how they apply it. So uh, for example, when I, in Argentina, I, I, I taught the, stu the professors who all said the same thing. I went to like four universities, they all said the same thing. So I taught them to play games using the concepts from, from semiotics to, to play certain games. And then all of a sudden they could see how they might be able to stop talking about semiotic theory for a few moments and, and apply it, show how it can be applied. So it's th the name of the game is understanding the concepts and how they can be applied. And whether you're dealing with uh, indigenous uh, works of art, uh, uh, automobiles, <laughs> uh, artifacts, or, uh, or, or theatrical presentations, you know. The name of the game is is how you apply it. And so you have to think uh, about how you can use these concepts, not just you think of them as sort of interesting and, and uh, then go on to some other aspect of the theory. I hope that answers the question. I don't know the questions. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Kapil uh, Kumar Bhattacharya. He's a faculty member in uh, Bhavanipur Educational Society. So uh, I, I would uh, request Kapil to kindly unmute yourself and if you can ask your question directly to Professor K.V. Nagaraj. <coughs> Hello, am I, am I audible? Yes, yes, please go on. Yeah, yes, my regards to both Professor Burger and Professor Nagaraj. Uh, Sir, uh, this uh, are two queries to Professor Nagra. My first query is that do you feel any communication or media research method or technique it can be adequately utilized for excavating communication thoughts from classical ancient texts for researchers who are working in classical ancient texts? Is there any good research uh, technique existing? And the second is, uh, do you feel that uh, it will be profitable if we explore some indigenous research methods as well to explore uh, ancient texts? Do you feel it would be better for uh, researchers who are working in that area, sir? Uh, thank you, Kapil. I know that you have been doing quite a lot of work in this area. Uh, I have also started taking interest and uh, right now my work is concentrated on Indian tradition of communication, where I am trying to find out uh, communication techniques of the sages, how they reach out to the masses, and how well. Event it was during those days. You can use techniques of the day. Find out what, uh, analysis is quality there is no quantitative analysis uh, regarding particularly the language aspect of communication because i have to go by uh, the linguist principles which are talked about of communication so that's what i am doing in text uh, it is very less so you have to manage on your own 
something innovative on your own by using whatever that is available and uh, i i definitely believe after reading a uh, little bit of shankara ramanuja patanjali and prabhakara i have come to the there is a huge amount of knowledge that is available for us to take out so if we can and bring it to the surface i believe there will be uh, quite uh, interest that is going to be generated in academic circles uh, i i believe because my the whole basis of my research is uh, based on scriptures that is you know that vedanta it is not vedanta but it is vedanta so based it on vedanta i believe there are principles embedded in about i think if we can use principles is uh, that is available to the people so that is what we take as you know uh, we are taking that is the common people so that they can also understand what existed earlier because we believe that the the elite so if we understand certain of these uh, scholars ramanuja or basavanta you know how they use the common man language to to the masses and you know the way they have created uh, their uh, uh, you know uh, sacred song they are all quite i think uh, we can learn quite a lot analyzing them and when we analyze them understanding you know, our uh, products of the world culture in india india a long time did documentation it evolved from mouth to mouth from one generation to another generation where our people are very creative they went on adding their own and today we have uh, everything on a very huge scale whether it is mahabharata ramayana what i don't want to go deep into uh, correctness or incorrectness of all these developments but uh, i believe if we can take what is available in the form of vedanta i think we will be able to decipher quite a lot of things uh, which can be interesting uh, you know the plain world that yes sir yes sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you very much sir so uh, and now i would uh, request professor shahidullah who has joined us from uh, bangladesh so uh, professor shahidullah if you want to make any comment or you want to you know uh, have any question did you talk to me i couldn't hear you no i'm okay so he has left the meeting so uh, i w- we have our faculty uh, you know colleague uh, mrs gazala yasmin with us here so uh, if i would request G- gazala ma'am if you want to ask anything you can kindly unmute yourself and ask if you want i don't i, I don't have any question to ask i, I would say one la- one last thing uh, about professor nagaraj uh, i i am one of those people who wanted them to communication i never took a communication course in my life uh i i studied english in, in for, for my bachelor's degree i studied um journalism with the idea of becoming a writer in newspapers or something like that for my master's degree and i have a phd in american studies so i'm one of the people who wandered into the field called communication like other sociologists for example uh, i know eli who cats he was down in at annaberg when i was there. he's a sociologist so many of the people who have made important contributions in communication are people who didn't study communication but sort of wandered into the field 
and some of them wandered out and some of them stayed there for the rest of their lives. And so that's what happened to me. I wandered in and I stayed there for the rest of my life. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it's very nice. <laughs> it's very nice that you're here. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I was a student of literature, uh, but I took interest in uh, uh, journalism because my family has been in journalism for the last uh, 14 years. <laughs> so uh, it was, uh, I was a journalist by birth in a way. Uh, you know, academic journalism is a little bit different from professional journalism. Actually, my entry in academic journalism was uh, an accident. I was a newspaper person and uh, I was interested in professional journalism. Somehow, I became an academic and I stayed in a very long time, like you. Kaifia? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, sir, uh, uh, thank you, sir. Now we have actually come to the end of this very enriching session. Uh, so I hope all the participants have thoroughly enjoyed uh, both of your deliberations. Uh, I would now request Sana Tabassum, who is the student of our department, uh, to kindly you know, give vote of thanks. Uh, Sana, please. Thank you so much for your kind words, ma'am. Uh, well, this was an extremely informative session. And I, on behalf of Alia University and the entire Department of Journalism and Mass Communication, would first like to extend my gratitude towards Professor Mohammad Ali, the Vice Chancellor of Alia University, and the administration for the encouragement and support towards the department. I would also like to thank Dr. Mohammad Riyaz, sir, for leading the department in such endeavors and working round the clock for arranging such enlightening webinars and for the betterment of the student. I would also like to extend my heartfelt gratitude towards the respected speakers of the day, uh, one from within our nation and one from outside India, Professor Arthur Bhaja, sir, and Professor K.V. Nagaraj, sir, who agreed to spare their valuable time and share, our, share their wisdom um, despite of the huge time difference and your prior engagement. Professor Arthur Bhaja, sir, you talked, us about, you talked about the techniques and analyzing of the of analyzing text. You even told us about the five focal points in studying media. You explained us about the media uh, myth model as to why myth actually is important part of our life. We generally don't realize it, but uh, thanks to you, we now get to know it. You even shared some of uh, your personal experiences and we were thrilled to know about it. So, Professor K.V. Nagarat, sir, you touched upon certain areas which needs careful consideration, the importance of research and how repetitive it has become. You even touch other important topics like plagiarism, decolonialization, and you even talked us. You even talked about the corporate responsibility in India and how TRP is being manipulated. I think we all know about it. And well, all these topics need very careful consideration. And as media scholars and researchers, we all need to bring careful changes to it. I would also like to express my gratitude towards Kefia, ma'am, who has been a constant support to us and a guiding pillar of strength for the department. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the participants for sparing their relaxed Sunday morning to attend this webinar and make it a success. Thank you for your patient listening and active participation. It encourages the department to hold more such events in future. Thank you.